Welcome to Practical Parenting. My name is Keely Pedro and I'm your host for today. Practical Parenting is here to support families who are struggling with their children to become the best parent that they can be. We are going to break the story that I believed, and I'm sure you do too, of the perfect parent and create our very own guilt-free story. So today I have Naomi Aldort with us. Naomi is the best-selling author of Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves. Naomi supports families with parenting issues internationally and her guidance is not about gentle ways to control a child but about how to have peace without having to control. It is about a way of being and of understanding children so they can do their best not because they fear us or seek our approval but they want to of their own free will. Wow. Thank you for being here with us today, Naomi. Um, it's well, such a pleasure for to have me. <laughs> such a pleasure. Now, um, I'm going to start with a question that I'm dying to ask you. Um, as a mum of three, three children, um, I find it really hard to get the right balance between my husband taking care of the home, taking care of the children and my work. How do you suggest that I and other parents listening can get this right without destroying ourselves with the guilt of not finishing things. Yeah, so first of all, I want to say something about guilt. Guilt doesn't help. It doesn't make it any better. So it's, let go of that. You are absolutely not guilty of anything. It's not a courthouse. So live your life, do the best you can. And children are very pliable. So the first answer is your children will be all right. Uh, if Charlie Chaplin became as successful and capable as he was with no parents at all, basically, a crazy mom, a drunken, divorced father, uh, and lived on the streets. Um, I know too many stories of people whose childhood was on the streets without parents at all. I'm not saying do that to your children on purpose. No, absolutely not. And not every one of them turned out all good, but not everyone that have two parents at home with everything and all the time and all the attention is turning out good. So we need to make peace with what is, but I'll give you some ideas to make it easier. Yes, please. Other than removing the, um, the you know, loving reality and, and trusting that children can handle whatever scarcity is, whatever the situation is. Um, there is something good about children getting less attention Husbands too, <laughs> I mean, it's part of the deal. Uh, it makes a child less child-centered so that the child is in a life where everybody is doing their own thing and are busy and it's not about him. There is something good about that. So I, I'm not so convinced that we need to all stay at home and pay attention to our children from morning to evening. Although, you know, it's nice if there is a parent um, so if you want to work less and share and live in a smaller house or some families even live in a tent in order for the parents to be there. Yeah, there are all kinds of options. Also, share the household with your husband equally. You're both living in a house, you're both working, you're both raising children, and no one should be not participating when the other one is doing something. So one making dinner, one cleaning the house, one being with the children, whatever it is. Another unusual suggestion is eat raw food. There is about 90% less work in the kitchen and it's 100% healthier. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I mean, I, you don't even have to be vegetarian. Today there is knowledge that when you eat grass-fed organic meat, eggs, you can eat all these things raw and they're actually better for you. So that's another possibility. Uh, if you are both working, you may have enough money to hire help. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, but we hired teenagers to come and play with the kids, uh, make dinner, wash the dishes. You know, we had a 15 years old who came three times a week, uh, prepared, you know, big soup for a couple of days, big salads. Uh, wash dishes or played with the youngest one, whichever was needed. Um, you know, have, having less 
and working less as a result of it. Sometimes we work two jobs and we have two cars and maybe we can have work one job, have a, one car, rent one room in the house if we have a big house uh, and have another person in the house, um, include friends and families, drop the kids off on, on families, not the baby, of course. Um, so to, to really look creatively, and I want to tell you that the most creative families I've ever encountered did everything. Some families, both parents, 100% with their children every day. Mm -hmm. And the way they do that is like this particular family, they sold their house and their land. So they did have, you know, some people are renting. So that solution isn't going to work for them. But maybe they shouldn't rent a house. Maybe they should go and pitch a tent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew a family who lived in a tent in the forest. And I knew a family who owned a house, so they sold it and moved to an area where houses are much cheaper, bought something small and simple and just stopped working. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of creative ways. Or I know a family who lived in a yard for a long time to just be able to be with the children. So see where you can possibly cut corners and one of you work on the half time or um, lots, lots of possibilities technically. But whatever the reality is, we need to love that and to be with the children the way that we can. And when we can't, validate that. I know you want me to play with you the whole day and mommy is busy and doing this and doing that. But definitely don't take time away from them for cleaning the house or for making dinner. That is not fair. Be with them and eat raw, unprepared food. We did it so often. My husband and I, I, I told him, look, my commitment is the children. So when you come home, the house is going to be a mess because I spend my day with the children. So I, I worked from home so I could do that. Not everybody can, but if you have that. And then when he came home, if we wanted to go out with the kids to the lake, to the park, then we'd say, okay, when we come home, we'll just grab a few tomatoes and cucumbers and avocado, put it on the table, uh, some yogurt, maybe cook a couple of eggs uh, and just cut it straight into a child's plate, whatever they want. And, you know, and the children said they loved those meals the best. So just keep in mind that food preparation is a hobby of adults. They want to turn food into what I call entertainment, into, you know, all this. It's not a must to say I can't be with my child because I want to do my hobby of turning food into this amazing pleasure. You know, just eat your tomato for God's sake. <laughs> you know, it's like you can bite into an apple, you can bite into avocado or, or just eat it with a spoon. Uh, or things that are easy to make, like a couple of eggs, or even putting some chicken in the stove if you're going to cook it and, um, and, and put nothing on it. We used to do chicken where we put nothing on it. We put it in the stove, we play with our kids, then we take it out. But of course, then there is cleaning to do with the raw trick. There's nothing to clean, nothing sticky, no crumbs, no nothing. So yeah um so lots of ways but mostly not to feel guilty on whatever way you choose it's like okay your children will live with that and they'll turn out just fine as long as who you are being is not scary safe loving and connected mm -hmm. those are the important things not you know that that you spend i, I mean i can't take it to extreme that's why i say skip the making food and be with them skip the cleaning the house and be with them i never cleaned the house when i was alone with my kids never yeah. when husband come home and he can be with them i can clean or he can clean mm -hmm. often he came home and the first thing he did is clean the mess of the day so you know include the husbands make sure they do their equal share and and um otherwise enjoy life the way it is Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, my next question is about an angry child. Um, lots of my clients and my friends have to deal with um, their child's aggression on a daily basis. Can you talk about dealing with children's aggressions uh, without <clears throat> being threatening or bribing? How do we do that? 
So first of all, we need to understand why the child is aggressive. And I don't want anybody listening to this to feel guilty. We all make mistakes. I made mistakes. We all make mistakes. One of the mistakes we make as we intend well is we teach our children to be aggressive and we don't realize that we do that. Mm -hmm. And we teach it starting in babyhood. Like we teach them that they must get what they want by hysterically running over to get something else if whatever they wanted. If the banana broke, here, I'll give you another one. If there is no other one, it's like, hey, look here, look here, there is a jingle, you know, already when they're babies. Mm -hmm. um, we give them the sense that they have to want something all the time because we entertain all the time and we distract them from emotional discomfort. Mm. And then they become easily angry. That's how we taught them that they must get their way. And if they don't get the way, they can't handle it. So now they lose control emotionally because we taught them to lose control. We taught them that it's horrible if they don't get, if life isn't going their way. And now, so the they get angry and they hit us or they hit someone or they bite. And our first reaction to it when they're little is like, oh, well, he doesn't mean it, she, she's so cute. She's, uh, it didn't really hurt. So we don't give a clear message that we don't do that. Mm. If we gave a clear message, the first time it ever happened, there wouldn't be a second. Okay. But we didn't. Not only that, but when they do that, it pays off for them. Not that you give them what they wanted, but somehow they're getting something out of it. You know, because you want to deflate and to stop the aggression. So you find a solution that actually is a payoff for them, that they, they like, even if it's just getting you off the the making dinner part and getting all the attention on them, uh, it works for them, which tells you, yeah, they need more attention. So don't wait until they misbehave. And then you give them negative attention, but they like that too. At least they got mommy to be. They also play and it's all unconscious. That's why I have a video on YouTube called, uh, and it's on my website, uh, The Child is Right explaining that whatever a child is doing, he's not trying to be aggressive. He has no other tool to get some valid need. Mm. So there is a valid need and the child is aggressive because we didn't figure out what that valid need is mm -hmm. and taken care of it. Doesn't mean we give it to them. Uh, I, wanting candy is not a need, but wanting care and connection wanting to feel valued that those are real needs that have to be addressed being able to express emotions is a real need being able to cry is a real need in somebody's arms or with somebody's listening so we need to figure out what or jealousy you know a lot of children start hitting because of baby brother or baby sister getting all the attention and they've lost the love, they've lost the connection. They feel like this is the, the tragedy of my life that this baby came. I love this baby, but I hate them because now mommy holds them all the time and not me. So there are specific needs, specific. And I have a whole chapter in the book, uh, what to do in, in the area of jealousy when you've got a baby and you've got a young child other than having them at least seven years apart and then that doesn't happen at all. But most kids are closer together, three years apart, four years apart. And jealousy is one very valid reason that in the book I address it and in private sessions of what to do. Uh, maybe later today we can talk about some of that uh, if you have a question about it, about um, jealousy. But the, the point is when a child is aggressive, find how you are the cause. It's like when something burns on the fire that you're cooking, it's not the pot or the water or the rice. It's you, right? Yeah. So if the child is not born aggressive, they learn from us, they figure out from the way we interact and respond what works. 
and they sometimes are simply out of control because of not getting enough care. Um, now, on the other hand, if we punish or threaten or yell at them, they'll behave much worse. So that creates despair. It teaches them to punish. It teaches them, and I have a whole article I'm writing that will be published in Pathways probably, or some other magazine <clears throat> about the harm <clears throat> of threatening, yelling, all the negative reactions or punishment. It doesn't work. It only teaches the child to be afraid of us. So we are fooled to think they behave better or not aggressive anymore because out of fear, they're complying now, mm -hmm. but it's the wrong reason. They're still, whatever the real need that we didn't address is still there. And they're learning to hurt others, to punish others, to punish you by hurting you. So punishment teaches them to be aggressive. Uh, so fear and compliance out of fear is not uh, the kind of good behavior that we want. It's fear-based behavior, which by the way, long-term leads to anxiety, depression, drug use, uh, and emotional disabilities, difficulties in marriage and everything. It's not, it's not a, a relationship of respect that allows children to flourish. Um, and then, and then remember that, you know, if you didn't do the first reaction, the really clear guidance, which the way I say to do it, like my third child, uh, while breastfeeding was the first time that unintentionally, so of course didn't deserve any, you know, nothing wrong, but there was a bite. And to make clear that we can't do that, I right away put my fingers on my boobs inside his mouth and opened his little teeth, the few that were there, and put him down. He was already a standing toddler and said, that hurts. We need to keep the mouth, you know, just uh, suction. And, you know, that happened a couple of times because he wasn't aware of it. Um, so, you know, if you want to give an example of what, you know, example from your life that you, you want me to address specifically, I'd be happy to. Um, when you say an example of um, aggression, like what is your child doing? Your aggressive child. Right. Um, so when they're told no, you can't have screen time, for example. So they're they're on they're on um, iPads and they're told no. It's time it's, it's time to end now. Yeah. So you see that doesn't work. <laughs> You're in the wrong on that one. <laughs> I'm not saying to let them have screen time. I wouldn't let them have screen time at all. Okay. <laughs> because if they have a little, they want more. So I wouldn't make, how old is this child? Eight. Yeah. So I'm not nuts about screen time being available to kids mm -hmm. at all. It's, it's not a good idea uh, until they're like teenagers. No. But if I made the mistake, excuse me, I'm trying to adjust so that you see me better. <laughs> um, but if I already made the mistake and, and, I, and, and they do have that, then I need to give them autonomy and information, mm -hmm. what it does to them, uh, and make life more interesting than wanting to do it. So, you know, how about suggesting to go outdoors? Because if you're the police, who is telling them, okay, you have to stop the pleasure that you're having right now. He's gonna hate you, he's gonna hit you, he's mm -hmm. gonna bite you, he's gonna be angry. Because, and that's how you're creating it. So it's a perfect example where the way you are controlling another human being, the moment we control another human being, they're human beings. No one likes to be told what to do. If somebody told you while you're doing this interview right now, okay, you have to stop now. How would you feel? Yeah. It's the same thing. So we need to find better ways. So when my kids started with internet or, or computers, they were already um, 13, 14. And we had a talk about it. I said, why don't you find online different articles uh, or videos explaining the pros and cons of it. And let's listen together and let's see what you think. But again, eight is a little young, but yeah, he can learn what's bad about it. 
and he can decide for himself that I shouldn't do it more than half an hour a day yeah. or don't have it available at all. Why, why access, why give children access to that? I mean, it's, it's either way, but not having access means you don't have access either, not in front of the kids. Right. So like we don't, didn't want our kids to eat sugar. There was no sugar at all, ever, ever. Yeah. There was no sugar at all. And there was no cookies with sugar in them. Wow. So it depends, you know, it depends what you want. We had no TV at all. Mm -hmm. So screen time was not available to us either. Mm -hmm. You can't be a second class citizen where, well, mommy can, can be on the screen, but, but you are not. Because that, again, that creates the child who will be aggressive necessarily. Mm -hmm. What else should you do? I mean, if you were a second class citizen and you see other people able to do X, Y, Z, but you are being, okay, it's time to stop now, How, you know. Yeah, you get angry. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you want to understand the child. You want to understand that they're angry because they're right. They have a valid reason for the anger. Yeah. And you have to address the issue. Mm -hmm. You spoke earlier about jealousy. Um, my sister has just had a baby and she has a six-year-old and he is very jealous, um, very, very jealous. Mm -hmm. How does she support them to grow up, to love one another? Yeah, well, first of all, we, again, we can't control other people. So mm -hmm. I can't promise that two people will love each other, mm -hmm. just like in romance, you know, just because people came from the same mother into the same household, it's a gambling. Are they compatible characters? Will they love each other? They probably love each other out of habit and living together, uh, but will they have a loving relationship? Very few do, for, especially all of life. I mean, how many roommates get along yeah. adults 100% of the time? And we're asking uh, children who didn't even want that brother or sister, or they thought they want, but they don't realize how much they lose. So the answer number one is make sure the older one doesn't lose anything, mm. that they still have a one-on-one -on -one time with mommy and daddy every day. Okay. Also as a three, with, when the baby is asleep maybe. Um, I mean, six years old usually are not jealous anymore. I was going to say, you know, my recommendation is seven years apart. When new teeth comes in, the frontal lobes have a huge transformation. And then the child, the older child is actually not jealous. Um, actually, they want to take care of a baby like a parent. Mm -hmm. But if a six years old is still like a four years old, still behaving with jealousy, then we are probably giving him a lot of reason to do that and the reason that we give is don't hurt the baby what does he hear the baby is important you are not yeah okay so we say a lot of things like that it's like be quiet the baby is nursing i want it to fall asleep i teach to say instead wow you and i will get time for ourselves she's falling asleep yeah. Let's be quiet so she falls asleep so she doesn't wake up. So I'm talking to the six years old or a four or five about them, not about the baby. I don't ask them to give up. Share your toys with her. Never know. Protect the toys of the older one. Put a gate around her. Put it in a high place. Put what she already built on a cardboard or a plywood and elevate it where the baby cannot reach it if it's already you know, crawling and stuff. Show her that her life is important to you mm -hmm. and that you are going to protect her privacy, her uh, autonomy, and that you love her and that you wanna have time with her. Oh, I'm with the baby all the time. God, it must be so difficult, I miss you. I wanna be just with you. And when daddy comes home, Take the baby, take the baby. I can't wait. I want to be with Ronnie. Yeah. Or whatever the name is. So, and then, you know, generally with siblings rivalry, a lot of what happens, a lot of the uh, jealousy can be erased in these ways. And also in the end of the book, 
I have precise instructions when the jealousy is already there, how to heal it. Okay. And you heal it by validating it. So you want to take, let's say I see my older child is grabbing things from the baby. Usually I'll validate it. You love making her cry. That feels very powerful. <laughs> this is like, you love it. Okay. So, but the baby doesn't like it. Why don't we do it? You know, so I take the older child to another room and I bring a doll and say, let's pretend this is a baby. Show me what you want to do. And they show me. They take a pretend chance, change so and cut it to pieces. They throw it out the window. They throw it to the garbage. I had my own middle child do all these things. You know, we, we did an imaginary uh, baby being thrown to the garbage, being thrown out, being cut to pieces, being thrown to the ceiling. <laughs> and I was supposed to act the baby crying while, the, oh, 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 no. You know, and, and it gave him not only therapy in terms of expressing the feeling, but also understanding, two understandings, understanding that we don't do it to the real child and understanding, most importantly, mommy understands me. It's all right to have these feelings. I'm not guilty, I'm not bad. See, if we get angry at them because they're hurting the child, their conclusion is I'm bad. Okay, a bad person should be aggressive. So it's a vicious cycle. So they become more bad because they're more desperate and because they start identifying with the image that we keep giving to them. You know, don't disturb, don't do that. Be quiet, the baby is asleep. You know, all these things, the baby, the baby, the baby, and you have to give up your life for the baby. When we stop doing that, the older child generally does love the baby and has no such problem. So now let's say that we have not just your sister, but two young children, two years old and a four years old, or even six years old and two years old. And you let them play together. And for five minutes, they really play. So you come to the conclusion and they say, oh, they're able to play together. No, they're not. It's the miracle five minutes max. Don't count on it. Four and six years old are not babysitters of two years old, too young. You wouldn't hire a six years old babysitter. <laughs> so you know it, you're fooling yourself, right? So, you know, why are we burning the rice again? We're putting a pot and rice with no water and then we're surprised. They can't do it. Don't leave them to play by themselves. Leave them right by your feet sense when the five minutes is coming to an end and pick up the baby and, and do something else or get the older kid if the baby is busy doing some, you know, blocks or, or drooling over, over a doll or whatever and seems happy, then take the older child when you see that's it, they're not going to succeed anymore and say, hey, how, 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 how about you come here and I'll read your book. And then the baby climbs too and gets on the boob and you have one baby on the boob and four years old or five years old on the other side and you read them a book and they feel like you're giving them all the attention because the mouth of the baby is shut, closed <laughs> with the boob. So <laughs> use those opportunities. It may be only five minutes as well or it may be more, who knows? Uh, but you, you have to be retaining the relationship with the older child and stop giving them the message that somehow the baby is important and we're all committed to the baby and they have to give up their life for the baby. Now, when older children fight, I teach something very simple. Don't take sides, ever. Don't take sides and don't provide toys that, one, that are one use. You know, if you have a horsey, and only one child has that and the other doesn't, you, they're gonna fight. Mm -hmm. But if you have three buckets of millions of, you know, non-specific Legos, not, not sets and stuff like that, or blocks or train trucks, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. or, or crayons and papers or Play-Doh with unlimited amount or play outdoors with sticks and stones, 
there is a lot less strife. It's not that it's guaranteed there won't be any, you know, he wants exactly that blue red block and there are not any more red blocks. <laughs> I mean, by the non-color ones, that's, that's actually even better. But so you provide that, but if they fight, they still will, you know, it's like adults fight. What do you expect? Um, so they have a problem. They need help with the problem or not. Um, so I come in and say, would you like some help? And if they say, no, we're just having fun, which often they do. If I see that maybe one is a victim and they're not both having fun, I ask the other one, are you having fun? If you need help, I'll help you. And if I see that they're not feeling free to tell the truth, if you have a household where everybody is safe to express themselves, that doesn't happen. You don't get somebody who's not feeling safe to tell you, yeah, he's, he's pl playing unfair with me and, and I want your help. Um, and then if they do ask your help, or you do figure out they need your help. You don't take sides. You come in, you ask, you wanna tell me what, what is the problem and we'll see what we can do. And one child, usually the younger, should talk first and they go, blah, 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 and he took this and I went to the bathroom and when I came back, the red blocks were gone and he took them all, blah, blah, blah. okay. Now, while the little one is talking, the older one is bursting no, 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 that's not what happened. You tell them, you'll get your turn as many times as you need. We're gonna go back and forth and both of you will tell everything and correct each other as many times as you want. So the first guy finished talking, say, okay, now you tell us your, your version. And the other one, well, when he went to the bathroom, he said he was done with blah, 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 whatever. And you listen, you validate. So I see, I see you thought that the blocks were available, but he's not coming back, but he's done. And blah, blah, blah. then when he came back, he pushed you and he was angry. And so you pushed him back. You kind of repeat the facts. Don't validate emotions, just mm -hmm. what you heard, just right. to let them know that you got it. And then the first one will say, no, that I, I told him specifically, whatever. You go back and forth. And I tell you what usually happens because this process takes a lot of time, but it teaches them how to make peace, how to stay real, how to be compassionate, mm -hmm. how to listen, mm -hmm. how to not ever take sides. And they get bored of the process at some point, 90% <laughs> of the time. One of them which eventually says, okay, I had enough, let's go outside and play ball. But if they absolutely want to resolve this, again, most of the time they will suggest a solution. Okay, why don't we next time have this, you know, let's create a flag when you know that you're coming back and you're still gonna, you know, keep building your thing. You put the flag, that means I'm coming back or whatever it is. Excuse me, that was my cat. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. Uh, so it's really important to never ever take sides and if they want your help in finding a solution try not to be the one offering a solution but if you absolutely have to then you can you know give few ideas but don't yeah. force them don't be the police just say you know you could do this or maybe you could put a flag when you leave or we can put a sign in our household there was one item that was a, a one and there was no way but for usually one or two people to use it and that's the piano. And we got musical kids. So, you know, if a child was playing the piano and went to the bathroom, another child sat in, that was a problem. So yeah, we decided to put a sign, we printed a sign to put on the music stand, I'm coming back, right. or, you know, Oliver is still playing. Uh, and then still, you know, they go to the bathroom, they may be there for a long time. So somebody uses the piano. But the kids, kids love rules. Right. They love, and especially when they make them. We, we do family meetings and decide how to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And when we solved it, they loved it. They loved keeping it. Like I put my sign, I have power in the matter. I have a solution. I come back, you know, they, they get up give each other the piano because 
they love it. It works for them when they're at the piano. So give them tools by empowering them and give them opportunities to create solutions rather than you decide or you punish or you take away. Some, in rare occasions, we have to take away stuff because it's our mistake. We gave a single item rather than making sure that we have the type of items that children can yeah. easily both have enough yeah. of. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. So we um, are in a pandemic, we're hopefully coming out of the pandemic now, and there, there's a lot of talk in schools um, about resilience. Um, research also shows that there's a huge rise in anxiety and depression in children and teens and, and children younger and younger. What are we doing wrong and how can we raise emotionally resilient children? So I'm going to do a full interview um, in a couple of weeks about this alone, not a video, it's gonna be a podcast um, that is by the editor of the Natural Mother magazine. So I just, uh, and that will be available for free. So it could be like the free gift. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to be as thorough now because of lack of time. Absolutely, yeah. uh, and a lot of it is not, has nothing to do with COVID. There is a trend that is very, very unhealthy of overprotectiveness or what's called the helicopter parent. Uh, we want children to be happy all the time. Mm. We want to prevent them from ever failing or falling or crying. Um, and, and that is what creates anxiety. Mm -hmm. COVID by itself, like my grandchild is five and a half and she's not being overprotected like that. And I don't think the wearing a mask or learning about what's going on is bothering her mm -hmm. at all. You know, it doesn't have to. Um, so we're raising kids also who are seeking approval. We constantly teach kids that they have to do things well. Good boy, good girl, that's very destructive. No, you don't have to be good. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult and anxiety provoking to live your life with parents looking at you all the time and evaluating what you're doing and telling you how good you are or no good you are, especially if they're mad at you when you're not successful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it's scary, so it's anxiety. Will I succeed? Will I have the good grades? There is also, the parents are modeling a lot of defense. If somebody tells, you know, the partners maybe say, hey, you were late today. They said, no, I wasn't. That's defense. Mm. Oh yeah, I was. Or, you know, look at the mess that you left here. Well, I didn't have time and you were going to do that. That's defense. Mm. That's scary for children. It's like you have to be perfect all the time. You can't just say, yeah, I left a mess. I made a huge mess. And yeah, I'm stinky. And I teach, and in that other interview, I will give more details on how to do therapy games to undo if you already did that kind of stuff. Now, there's also issues of diet, a lot of food. A lot of people today are into being vegan, which is not healthy for kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and a lot of fruit and a lot of sugar will get kids to be very emotional and more prone to anxiety. Um, parents being perfect, hiding their own flaws mm -hmm. in the way that I just said, or just pretending to be the, hey, say, you know, I was stupid today. You know what I do is one child saying to the other child, you're stupid. I say, me too. And I go and give an example of my own stupidity or I make it up if I can't remember on the spot. Not that there is any lack of it. <laughs> There's for all of us plenty of stupid moments. And you know what the kids do? Oh yeah, no, I, mine was stupider. I did this, I, you know, immediately they compete of who was stupider. Now they're not afraid anymore for somebody calling them stupid. They're not gonna get anxiety over a bad grade. It's the same thing. It's like, yeah, sometimes I'm stupid. Sometimes I'm stinky. Sometimes I'm an asshole. Sometimes I'm mean, sometimes I'm wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this, sometimes that. It's all all right. You know, otherwise we're making them to be what we call sensitive. It's not sensitive. It's easily triggered. Yeah. It's self-centered. 
all about me, me, me having to be perfect and loved all the time and appreciated all the time. No, show them. Oh God, I was a terrible mother today. I understand why you're angry at me. Yucky mom, <laughs> did this and this and this. I wasn't thinking, I was stupid, I was this and that. And then when they are, so it's like, yeah, you spilled it. That was really funny, you know, and it's fine. Or I was angry and I was screaming or just let people be real human beings. And by the way, praising causes the same harm. Praising rewards, very anxiety causing. Wow. It's like if the child becomes addicted to, I must get the praise or I'm not good. I'm not loved, I'm not worthy unless I get the good grades, the praise, the mom's approval. So insecurity, another word for insecurity in my vocabulary is dependency on approval, looking for approval externally. And that's totally, totally unhealthy. And then we push them to a competitive world where they have to be the best student and go to Harvard or to a good university and become a doctor you know, and we have all this uh, meritocracy that is very destructive in society. And that's even without jealousy and without COVID. Um, so, you know, COVID put the kids in front of the screen and I wouldn't do that. Mm. If your child goes to school, I would say if they can't go to school, let them be homeschooled because it almost seems like the system is just addicting all the kids to screen time. Um, and that's that's not really good for them. So why don't you just try homeschooling for a while? Yeah. A lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. that's that's the short answer to the question because I know we have time limit. But there will be something going up on your site. Yes, eventually it will be on the site. Um, it will be the same kind of thing where people will have to sign up. Yeah. <clears throat> and eventually when the, the program is over, it will be on my site for free. Okay. Amazing. And, and I will talk about depression, anxiety, what to do, how to avoid, and go a lot deeper into all this um, fast talk that I just, you know, covered three miles in an inch. <laughs> Okay, so just quickly and finally, um, when parents follow the respectful parenting approach, the child often doesn't seem to fit in with other children. How do you suggest that we help children, our children that don't fit in if we do follow this, this approach? Oh, it's a great result of being respectful. They should not fit in. The most powerful people are those who did not fit in, starting with Edison and Einstein and Mozart. Uh, to many, many others, men and women, uh, fitting in being, means being cloned into, you know, good boys and girls like everybody else. It's dangerous because it means uh, being committed to fitting in and it means falling for peer pressure eventually, mm. uh, looking good, seeking approval, uh, following the gang or the, the peers who are doing drugs or drinking or uh, driving in an unsafe, unsafe way. Uh, it's even subliminally in a, in a generic way makes you more prone to molestation mm -hmm. uh, because a molester will tell you how to fit in with him mm -hmm. or, you know, like, you know, we'll do this and then there's all these psychological things that ride on the desire of the child to fit in, mm -hmm. uh, even with one person. So it's, it's a compliment and a good thing. Look at who are the people who rise to the top in terms of, I don't mean becoming famous necessarily, but in terms of emotional well-being, staying. It's the first thing I teach when they ask me at the end of an interview often, what's the bottom line, the most important thing for children? I say that they are rooted in themselves and not go for fitting in. Right that they listen inside, not outside. So it's a good thing. It means self-confidence. It's the kid that we admire who says, you know, like I do my thing. I'll give you a story, an example. My uh, firstborn, when he was six years old, uh, I took him to the YMCA where they had a little program where kids can do all kinds of crafts and the parents can go do their errands. Well, I didn't go do the errands. I just thought he would have a good time there. 
So I stayed there and there were young girls going around and praising the kids. He was not used to that. And he was so absorbed in what he was doing that this girl thought that he was autistic or something was wrong with him. And she came to me and she said, I go from child to child and I praise them. That's part of my job. And they all thank me and shining eyes and feel so great. Is something wrong with your child? He doesn't seem to be responding. And I had to say to her, no, he couldn't care less about what you're saying about him. He's free. He's strong. He's rooted in himself. Now he's a leader in our community. And, you know, when you're a leader, some people like you, some people don't. I know it personally. You don't care. You don't need to fit in. You don't need anybody's approval. That's strength. And that's not falling from peer pressure. So it's a good thing. I, was, I would encourage it. So if it, my child goes to school and says, you know, the kids laugh at me because I'm this and this and that, then I would encourage him. I say, so what's great about that you're this and this and that? My other kid, when he was a teenager, that exactly happened to him. He was very soft and intellectual and the kids were into more macho and have a girlfriend and you know all this stuff and he came home one day and he said that his best friend and two other girls make fun of him called him sissy and gay he's, he's heterosexual complete but I, my granddaughter uh, is his daughter uh anyway and i said um so what did you say to them because I thought he would be upset or something. He said, oh, it didn't bother me. I just told him whatever, you know, that's your spill. It didn't bother him, didn't hurt him. So you get teenagers back to the anxiety questions, falling apart mm. because of being name called, uh, or even just online. And, and, you know, sometimes even committing suicide because they take so seriously what some, the fitting in, the somebody, what they think of them, having to be like everybody else, eating the same junk as everybody else, looking at the same stuff as everybody else. And, you know, you get the strong people are those who don't care about that. They go their own way. That's happiness. Yeah. That ensures that you're not dependent and not scared to be a certain way because you love yourself the way you are and you are confident in you, listening to you, caring about others, but from your point of view, not because of pressure to be like them. That's true independence and love and care. Wow, thank you. That was absolutely amazing. So I know that you have lots of free resources on your website, Naomi. Um, our viewers just need to go to www.naomiaudot.com. Yes. You are so generous on there. There's video. And if you forget my name, write authentic parent, not parenting. Authenticparent.com, authenticchild.com will take you to the same place. Excellent. I think one, one of the things that I think is absolutely amazing about you is that you talk about teaching us how to undo. So it's, it's not like, oh my gosh, I've not done it. What do I do? It's how to undo. And I love that. I absolutely love that. That's, that's my book, Raising Our Children is about raising ourselves. It's ongoing. That's why people call me a lot on Zoom like this privately and get sessions to correct. Even after years of, you know, doing all kinds of stuff that didn't work well, children are resilient. When we change, we, we learn new ways, they heal. It's, it's phenomenal, it's so powerful. So I do uh, sessions, all the information is on the website, how to get uh, uh, sessions privately with me. People also come here, well, not now with the COVID thing, but uh, generally families come to what I call family intensives. And there is a page about group. Uh, you know, if you can't afford to do your own private session, you can collect a minimum of five people right. and then it's a lot cheaper and I do two hours for five people or more mm -hmm. and, and you ask the same questions and you hear me answering other people's questions mm -hmm. so you get a lot out of it so uh, and there are big classes as well web classes and there are cds to buy and mp3s and and uh, access to videos of former classes there's just 
endless amount and a lot of it is free. Um, so really teach yourself and be willing to grow and don't feel guilty. Uh, we're all learning along the way. I've made lots of mistakes too. Wow. Well, human be beings. Thank you so much for your time and for your generosity. And I'd like to thank our viewers for um, tuning in today. So stay tuned for the next amazing interview on today's lineup.